I'm sure it's no big surprise here that I enjoy cartoons, comics, graphic novels if you will. One of my fondest childhood memories is every Sunday morning sitting by the fireplace reading Calvin and Hobbes. But one thing that might actually come as a surprise to you is that a lot of the comics I read growing up actually weren't in English. A good portion of my family comes from a country known as Belgium, and for you uneducated folks out there, that's this country. The one between France, Germany, and the Netherlands. And before you even ask, yes, my family does make a lot of waffles and fries. And they are amazing. But what's even better than Belgium's taste in waffles? They're comics, that's what. The French and Belgians made a lot of comic books. And when I say comics, I'm not talking like the ever popular superhero comics or anything like that. No, the Europeans like things a lot more wacky and zany and there were a lot of them. Lots and lots of comic books. But hey, can you blame them? I mean, who doesn't love to make comic books? I know I do. The laws of physics allow you not to be a cow. You can't tell me what to do, physics! I can be a cow if I want. <sighs> Today, I'm gonna share with you guys a few of the French slash Belgian comics that I grew up with, but I didn't really wanna tackle this topic on my own, so I went ahead and got myself an accomplice for today's video. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you all to meet... Howdy there, partner. Hello, boy toy. Uh... Hello, you beautiful butt nugget. Wh Who are you? That's Mr. Prime. I guess you could call him a friend. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was just going to be you today. Well, Mr. Prime is kind of a stubborn individual. He insisted to join us today because he wants to make fun of the both of us. Gee, sounds like a nice guy. Yeah, that's Mr. Prime for you. He's a person whose entire existence revolves around making my life miserable. Huh, that's funny. I mean, just by looking at him, you'd assume he's a person who's big on self-reflection. I have no idea where you're getting that from. You deserve to die for that. We've got four comic series that me and Steven are going to share with you all today. We'll start off with the one that you're probably most familiar with and gradually progress to the more obscure titles. So to kick us off, let's begin with Les Schtroumpfs, or as you probably know them as, The Smurfs. Out of all the Belgian or French comics out there, The Smurfs are probably the ones you're most familiar with, since in 1981, the company Hanna-Barbera, the creators of Tom and Jerry, Flintstones, and Scooby-Doo, picked it up for its own animated television show, popularizing The Smurfs for the North American audience. I watched the animated TV series when I was a kid, and I still like watching it today. Though, I have to admit, about 50% of my enjoyment is not for the intended reason. Guys, this is a Hanna-Barbera cartoon from the 80s. Those consist of some of the funniest crap I've ever seen. But what you probably don't know about the Smurfs is that they date much farther back in 1958. In fact, their first appearance wasn't even their own comic. The first time the Smurfs ever appeared was in a series called Joanne et Pierre-Louis, the entry called La Flûte à Six Trompes. They ended up getting popular enough that they got their own series about five years later. If you've seen the animated show, then you're basically familiar with the books themselves, but for those who haven't seen the show, I'll give you a little rundown. The Smurfs are a race of these blue creatures that are about the size of your hand. It takes place during the medieval times, and the Smurfs themselves live in a hidden village in a forest far away from human civilization. The book contains about two or three short stories, which typically revolve around two conflicts. The first being a Smurfs trying to protect themselves from their enemy Gargamel. He hates everything good and nice in the world, and wants to exterminate all the Smurfs, usually making a potion out of their corpses or something. He wants to eat them. He likes eating Smurfs. That's his, that's his jam. Gargamel, have you ever tasted a Smurf before? How do you know they don't taste like garbage? Or British croaking? <laughs> The other reoccurring conflict are the Smurfs just learning to be better people, like in Le Stromfissime or King Smurf where they learn the problems with monarchy and how the abuse in power can lead to rebellion, war, and actual bombing. Or in The Magic Egg where greed, selfishness, and envy causes all the Smurfs to fall into chaos. Or how about 
the purple smurfs their lesson on racism the original comic is known as the black smurfs now i don't actually happen to own this original comic but i've seen a bit of it and let me tell you you can get a pretty good sense of what it's like if you watch the episode and replace each time they say the word purple with black Papa Smurf! Oh, Papa Smurf! Look! The blacks are coming! <laughs> I am the worst thing to ever worse ever. Okay, just keep that in mind the next time you're feeling bad about yourself. You cannot worse worse than me. The Smurfs have some pretty fun stories, but it gets kind of confusing at times. Like how the entire race functions with only one female who is created in a laboratory by their arch enemy. The only female had to be created through alchemy. Just, where do Smurfs come from? Probably from that hole you crawled out of. Um, okay. Like there's even a story where a fake Smurf comes in to kill them all and they just accept it. No questions asked. Like, are they just used to Smurfs just randomly appearing like that? There's only a hundred of them, I feel like they'd be familiar enough with each other. When a baby Smurf comes in, they act so surprised and confused. Like, even the ancient records kept by their leaders have no information on Smurf offspring. Baby Smurfs, baby Smurfs, nothing about uh, baby Smurfs. This is a conspiracy. This has to be the universe's greatest mystery, and I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. Just... As soon as I can crack the code to the Smurfs language. Say, didn't you love Smurfing with Papa Smurf at the Smurf Yester Smurf? Uh, si, senor. Up next on our list is Les Adventures de Tintin, or in English, The Adventures of Tintin. <laughs> If I wasn't doing this video in order of obscurity, then I'd probably save this one for the very end because it's just fact that Tintin is the best one. While the Smurfs had a couple stories per book, Tintin had one story dedicated to each book. Heck, some even panned across multiple books. Les Aventures de Tintin stories were kind of a mixture of adventure, mystery, and crime solving. This series of comics was kind of like the French or European Indiana Jones, but came long before that. The stories were a lot more realistic than things like the Smurfs, but wasn't afraid to dip its toes in supernatural topics, all packaged together with fun characters like the clumsy Thompson and Thompson, the rage-induced alcoholic Captain Attic, and the partially deaf intellect Professor Calculus. What was really nice about Tintin was it never took itself too serious. You have moments where sharks dance around drunk and dogs howl at the sound of an opera singer, but that's not to say there weren't any moments that were freaking terrifying. What's going on? Is the writer's strike over yet? Bugsy? I still quiver just thinking about it. The Cigars of the Fairy was one that really stuck with me as a kid. The book had a lot of weird imagery in it, and the story introduced just the actual idea of insanity to me. As a kid, it freaked me out, but I just couldn't stop reading it. It was almost like the book was pulling me into its own insanity. Poor fellow. Never recovered either. <laughs> you are starting to make seven years seem less and less like a punishment right now. I can see what you mean. A lot of things in Tintin stories don't come across as child-friendly. Especially a good portion of them involve drug smuggling, but that's what made Tintin so cool. What better way to get your parents to let you read about a guy drilling a piece of dynamite into a rhino and blowing it up to smithereens than to ask for a colorful comic book? Tintin is unstoppable. He could have adventures anywhere in the world, in China, in South America, in the tundra, the Middle East, the Congo. Mmm, is that 1930s I smell? And the middle of the ocean. Not even our atmosphere can contain Tintin. This is why Tintin was a badass. Hey! No swearing on my profile! You're probably familiar with Tintin because of the Steven Spielberg movie, which I heard was a lot more popular overseas than it was in North America. The movie itself was kind of a mix of the crab with the golden claws and the secret of the unicorn. Apparently, there are still some plans to make a sequel to that movie called The Adventures of Tintin, Prisoners of the Sun. It should be simple enough. All they just have to do is make the movie at this point. But that's enough of Tintin. Now let's move on to the next one. Asterix le Gaulois. 
Oh, yes, Asterix. That's easily my favorite one of them all. Oh, really? Yeah, I would read as many of these as I could find in the school library and read them all throughout recess instead of talking to kids or making friends or talking to kids who didn't want to be my friends. I couldn't even make friends even if I did talk to other kids. Well, I did make some friends through the Asterix books. I, we'd pretend to fight large groups of Roman soldiers outside and... I've seen the live-action movies a lot, and the animated ones, too. I've got my own collection of them at my house. Huh, <laughs> that's neat. Kind of reminds me of my own elementary school obsessions. Wait, did you say live-action movies? Oh yeah, there are quite a few of them. There's um, Asterix et Obélix contre César, Asterix et Obélix uh, Mission Cléopâtre, Asterix et Obélix uh, Jeux Sympathique, et Asterix et Obélix au service de sa majesté. Oh my word, these are real? I had no idea they made live-action movies of... And put them on Game Boy 2? Wow. Diving into these will have to be an adventure for another day. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Right. Asterix de Gaulle, or Asterix de Gaulle, is the combined efforts of Goscinny and Uderzo. The comics is a play off the European history with the Gauls and the Romans. <clears throat> the year is 50 BC. Gaul is entirely occupied by the Romans. Well, not entirely. One small village of indomitable Gauls still hold out against the invaders. And life is not easy for the Roman legionnaires who garrison the fortified camps off of Totorum, Acarium, Londinium, and Compendium. Much like Tintin, each book of Asterix had one story throughout its duration. As you heard in my impressive dramatic reading, in this universe the Romans have captured all but one village in France and will stop at nothing to get that last one. This village has access to a magic potion, however, that gives them super strength, which is how they managed to fend off the Romans for so long. Most of these stories involve the Gaulish village ruining the Romans slash Caesar's plans to capture it, with Asterix and Obelix as the main characters. This series really shines with personality, like each character is designed with distinct features that allow them to stand out, and every single panel is packed with expression which really gives off its charm the, the, and the appeal of this book. They may be still pictures, but boy does this comic feel animated. Heck, if you want to see an example of the series' charm, take a look at the characters themselves. They're all basically caricatures whose names are terrible puns that end in X for some reason. Asterix isn't as obvious as the other characters are as far as the pun in his name goes. But then there's his friend Obelix, who loves large pointy stones. Or in other words, an obelisk. Then there's their dog, Dogmatics, the village chief, Vital Statistics, the blacksmith, Fully Automatics, the merchant who constantly sells rotten fish named Unhygienics, their awful musician is named Cacophonix. No, wait, hold on, hold on, there's more. The village elder's name is Geriatrix. The, the druid who makes the magic potion's name is Getafix. And the snarky teenager is named Just For Kicks. I, I'm not saying these are bad. I'm just, it's just, what's next? Uh, the local pedophile named Pediatrics? Like, whose job was it to come up with these names? Uh, whose job was it to just sit there and research words that end with the suffix X for the weird gimmicks of explaining each character's characteristics like this? Uh, is naming them after their shticks going to fix anything? These childish antics make me want to take some antiseptics. It's pure bollocks. I'm really glad you had a lot to say about Asterix, because I didn't really have that much to say. Vraiment? I, I mean, really? Yeah, I remember reading one book, I think it was called Le Domaine des Dieux. Oh, look at that, another uh, purple smurf. Other than that, I remember seeing Asterix and the Vikings, as well as Asterix and Cleopatra. Okay, so we've looked at fantasy, adventure mystery, historical fiction, but what about one that's just for the laughs? Nothing but dumb fun. Our last comic today is going to cover just that, which I don't expect anyone watching us to be familiar with because it didn't really get an English translation. Here we have Quick et Fluk, which I guess in English would be pronounced as Quick and Flupk. Oui, monsieur, je peux parler en français. So yeah, Quick et Fluk. All other comics mentioned in this video used the format to tell a story. Sure, there were some humorous elements to them, but there was continuity from page to page to tell an overall story. However, Quick et Fluk was more like something you'd find in the newspaper funnies. Each page was just another joke with two troublemaking children named Quick and Fluk. Now does this art style look familiar to you? 
It should, because this comic was created by Hergé, the same name behind Tintin. You'll even see they'll reference each other quite a bit. As a young child learning French, it was difficult for me to read the other comics because I didn't really understand French that well, and since they relied heavily on dialogue, you couldn't really get into them unless you had a strong grasp of the language. But Quickie Fluke was short and simple enough that most of the time, you could just tell what's going on from visual clues alone, and knowing the language wasn't really that necessary. Well, most of the time at least. Now all the other comics had animated versions, so did this one? It was pretty niche, but... Yeah, it actually does, and I watched it a bunch as a kid. On this. No, I am not pulling your leg. This is actually what I watched it on. Man, where on earth did we get this? What diseases are crawling all over this? Oh man, this quality is awful! This thing is so bright! But as a kid, I didn't really care. I guess as long as I saw moving pictures, then I was perfectly content. There were these weird transitions between each of the sketches, and as a kid, I'd try to make a connection between the transition and the sketch that just played right before it. For example, this one meant that the sketch before it had to do with food in some way. This one meant that someone got hit in the head really hard. And you know what? I'll let you make your own conclusions on this next one. You know, this may not have been the best influence on me because these kids sure do seem to get in trouble with the police a lot. So, those were the four Belgian French comic series that we grew up with. I wanted this video to act as an introduction to some memorable franchises you may or may not have been familiar with. As a kid, I couldn't really share my fascination with these comics with anyone else because no one really knew about them. But now with the power of the internet, I finally have that chance. So I really hope this video enlightened you a bit. And thanks again, Steven, for joining me today on this video. Oh, sure thing, or should I say, de rien. I put a link to the French Pineapples channel in the description below, so be sure to check it out. Steven makes some pretty cool memes. No, he doesn't.